On Thursday this week, my sister and I went up to Pennsylvania to where my mother lives to have a, what they call a family care plan meeting with the people who run the assisted living unit that she lives in. We went with great trepidation because normally when they call for one of these meetings, it's because they think it's time to move that person from one level of, level of care to the next. And my mother had made it very clear she wanted to stay where she was. I had made it abundantly, one might even say rudely clear in my communications with the management that that was what she wanted and what we wanted, but we thought perhaps they had the upper hand and that would be the end of it. But maybe it was because of all of our expressing our desires that the meeting turned out not to be quite so much about that. That's still in the future someplace probably, but more about the quality of services that she's getting, what makes her able to stay where she is, physical therapy and occupational therapy and memory exercises and getting to events and all the things that, that enable you to have a life. And particularly important was physical therapy because if you can't walk, you really can't do much else. And we talked about how well she had done in physical therapy when she had Phil as her physical therapist. I mean, she loved Phil. She really, really loved Phil. And because they had a relationship, she knew his history. She knew about his children, where they were going to college, where he, what his job plans were, everything about him. She knew about his life. They, they, they knew each other. And because of that, he could get her to do just about anything. But then Phil left and went to take another job. And a new physical therapist began working with my mom. And even the management, who are focused, of course, on the bottom line in the various respects that they have to, were very honest and clear that until they form a relationship, until there's rapport between a patient and the person helping that person, not much is going to get accomplished. <clears throat> So we're hoping that the new physical therapist will turn out to be someone who is good with my mom, that they like each other, and that the progress will begin again. But the key thing is not even so much what does that person know about physical therapy, although I hope that person is good at it. It's really more about how much that person is able to enter into a relationship. And that, dear friends, is where we find ourselves this morning. You may know that we hear the lessons read on Sunday morning on a three-year cycle. And so, in the 15 years that I've been preaching, this particular set of lessons has come up five times. Normally, I will think about what does the congregation need to hear now. I'll adjust what I'm going to say, even though the lessons may be the same as they were three years ago. But on this occasion, every time this comes up, I preach the same sermon. And I will give you the punchline now and violate all the usual rules of homiletics. Relationships matter. If you hear nothing else, please take that away. Relationships matter. That is so critical because it's, it's such a basic human trait. We do it all the time. We do it with our spouse. We do it with our children. We do it with our friends. <clears throat> Whether you realize it or not, we do it with the person who fills our order at Dunkin' Donuts tomorrow morning. We have relationships with all of these people. I can tell it all myself. I go to Brouhaha to get tea in the morning. I've gone there often enough that now when I walk in, I don't even order. I walk up to the register, the person behind the register puts my order in and everything is taken care of because they know who I am, I know who they are, I always get the same thing. We have a relationship. It's so important and so often we form them without even realizing that we're doing it. Whenever I officiate at a wedding, there's a point when I embarrass the couple by making them turn around and look at all those people who are sitting out there behind them. And I ask them, do you understand how many relationships you have created with those people and between those people? Any relationship that you and I have is only the surface level of everything else that's going on that we have created as a result of it. It's so important to recognize that those relationships are durable in ways that we don't necessarily even recognize. We can't treat them as being disposable or instrumental, as something that's just there for our convenience. We as followers of Jesus must recognize that something is holy is happening in all those relationships that we form. This is all the more worrying when you go back and look at the social research. I should probably stop reading Pew surveys, but I keep doing it. 
There was one a couple of years ago where they asked people across the age range, but the worrying part was people under 30, teenagers and people in their 20, 20s. In that demographic group, 50% said you can't trust other people. 70% said that if someone else has a chance to take advantage of you, they will. It's alarming to imagine how people who feel that way, who feel that they have so little trust in other people, are ever able to form relationships. And how dangerous that is for society and from our perspective for the kingdom of God. There is good evidence, dear friends, that being in stable, loving relationships of all sorts, not just necessarily marriage, but friendships, you know, what in, in social science they call social support, anyone you can depend on, anyone you can, you can, you can tell your troubles to, there's good evidence that having those relationships and having them be fruitful and stable has health benefits, it makes us happier, it even makes us live longer. That's all very well, but it's also important from a spiritual perspective, dear friends. We know that each one of us is the icon of Christ. We take that out into the world. We know that everyone else is the icon of Christ too, although that is often a harder lesson to learn. So when we encounter those people, we are encountering the icon of Christ too, and now something happens between us that is holy. If we fail to do that, dear friends, how much risk is there that we have failed to fulfill the wishes of God? We have failed to provide that opportunity in which the kingdom of God can begin to grow between us. Our entire understanding of why people are valuable is because they are the icons of Christ. If we don't trust them even that much, how often do we fail to recognize Jesus in our midst? How often do we fail to see God in front of us when we are in the moments and the events of our days? If we fail to do that, we, we, we are in great peril. It says someplace, when two or three are gathered together, I will be in the midst of them. You may remember having read that somewhere in the Bible. What happens if that doesn't happen? Without those encounters, there can be no community. Without those encounters and without that community, there can be no agape. There can be no love of Christ poured out. It's all the more important to recognize that every one of those encounters, every one of those relationships that we build, hopefully build, hopefully sustain, hopefully try to help grow, is a holy vessel in the midst of which there is something that God is pouring, some, some, a blessing that God desires to pour out onto the world. If we fail to recognize those relationships, if we fail to sustain them, what happens to that vessel? Is it broken? Worse yet, is it left full? The blessing of God not poured out on the world simply because we would not allow it to happen. That brings us back to roughly the context of what Jesus is talking about in the gospel this morning. You know that they, they, they came to Him with this trick question because no matter how He answered it, they figured they got Him. Either He says, yeah, you can divorce your spouse, in which case He's hard-hearted and His followers won't follow Him anymore, or He says, no, you may not divorce your spouse, and, uh, or, or you, you, you may not divorce your spouse He's adhering to the law, but he's hard-hearted. You can divorce your spouse. He's being kind, but now he's violated the law. Either way, he's been shown to be a fraud and nobody will follow him anymore. Jesus knows what they're up to. He goes directly to what's truly important, the nature of the relationship that they're talking about in legal terms. Whenever I counsel a couple who are having difficulties in their marriage and are contemplating getting divorced, I ask them, what is happening in your relationship? Is it something that is constructing the kingdom of God or is it something that's destroying the kingdom of God? 
ultimately that is the question we have to answer. That is the reason why in some cases for the good of the kingdom of God a relationship must end. For the good of the people in it, for the good of the community, for the good of what it is that God desires for those people and for everyone. But even in that case, we must couch it in terms of what it means spiritually. How even in the ending of a relationship, some blessing may come. So, my challenge to you and to me and to all of us is that in every encounter we have this week, we will see the relationship that has begun, that is continuing, that is deepening, that is enriching us, the people we meet. Every chance we have to be the icon of Christ to someone else, every chance we have to recognize the icon of Christ in someone else. Remember that relationships matter. Treasure them. Recognize what it is God tries to do through each one of us. The love that God pours out between us. We can't risk losing it. Amen.